OK, thanks a lot. It's great to be back in Edmonton. I came out here as a prospective PhD student, actually, in woo, a, long, a long time ago. I came in the wrong month, though. I came in March. Uh, and that kind of influenced my decision to be in, in Toronto. But you know, it could have been a completely different life. So uh, it's a great city. And it's, uh, I'm really happy that we decided to rotate the, the summer schools uh, to different cities so everybody can get a, a taste of different places within the country. So. Uh, I'm going to approach today's lecture from the point of view of learning from images at scale. So for a long time, images have been a common test bed for deep learning. And in fact, there's actually this analogy that the MNIST data set is to deep learning researchers as fruit flies are to biologists. And those of you who know the story of the 2012 ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, uh, which some consider a turning point in deep learning, know that computer vision and machine learning have been intimately linked. So we spent some time this morning with Hugo learning about feed forward neural nets. And these are typically applied on smaller patches or tiny images, such as those found in MNIST and CIFAR-10 and SVHN and these sorts of benchmarks. But what if we want to scale up visual recognition to larger, more realistic images, such as those found in ImageNet and other data sets? So using feed forward neural networks, we've operated on vectors basically paying no attention to any structured relationships among the elements in the input. And of course, we can flatten this image to a vector, collapse its 2D structure, uh, but this would ignore readily available structural information that might be useful to solving the visual recognition tasks and also gaining some efficiencies. So, just as machine learning practitioners often engineer discriminative features at the input level based on their domain knowledge, we can also infuse domain knowledge into the model architecture itself. And we call this inductive bias. So today we're going to discuss a particular type of architecture called a convolutional, convolutional neural net, or CNN, I'm going to use a lot for short, that has a very strong inductive bias. Uh, towards signal type data. And as we're going to see later, signals can be, mean more than images. It could be audio clips, it could be uh, hyperspectral measurements that have been collected from soil samples. But for now, we're going to focus on images because this has been the dominant domain of CNNs. So, as many of you are already very familiar with already, CNNs have been extremely successful and they're driving most in this industrial image recognition pipelines. And contributing to their success, one, is their compositionality and use of hierarchy. So solving problems that some have said are somewhat analogous to humans. And learned representations, just like we heard about this morning, reduce the need for domain-specific engineering at the input. And also, CNNs are trained by pretty simple, straightforward gradient descent-based optimizers. So these first three properties that we have up here are actually shared with feed-forward or fully connected nets. But unlike fully connected nets, there's also a couple other properties. Um, one, the feature maps or features of these CNNs are organized in a topology, a 2D topology. So um, this yields what's called a local receptive field that bears some similarity to the visual cortex. And they also leverage something called translation equivariance. So that means when you shift the input slightly, you'll see the exact same shift occur in the feature maps themselves. And by an operation that we'll hear about later known as pooling, we actually gain something called translation invariance, which means when you shift the input, you actually see no change in the response for uh, at the level of the feature maps. Now, this is only for small shifts of the inputs. But this, is, uh, this makes CNNs pretty robust to classification, or for classification, OK? So um, this is just sort of an overview of what's so great about CNNs. We'll now dig in deeper into some of these properties. OK, so going back to the fully network, connected network that we learned about this morning, what happens if we take a 200 by 200 pixel image, 
and connect it to an equivalent number of hidden units. So we got 40K hidden units, a 200 by 200 image. If we use the networks that we learned about this morning, we get 2 billion parameters. Okay, so that's a lot of parameters. And also spatial correlation in images is local. So there's actually a motivation to connect the network more locally than completely globally like we see here. So there's no need really to have a single feature. Uh, oh, I don't know if this is gonna work up here. Yeah, like this guy connected to the entire image. So borrowing a term from neuroscience, we shouldn't have for a single feature the entire image be its receptive field. Uh, and that, what it means is that's, that's the region of the input or the image to which it's connected. So intuitively, we would never have enough label data to fit a model like this, so we have to change something. So let's say we connect locally using some of these intuitions, locally in, in 10 by 10 windows. So this reduces our parameterization to four million parameters. It's still a lot, but now we have these local receptive fields. Each one of these uh, units looks at a 10 by 10 window. But why are we detecting the same features at multiple locations in the image anyway? So for an image like this, a face, faces might be registered, meaning that certain uh, elements like noses and, and eyes and so forth occur generally at the center of the image. So we actually might want to use a structure like this, but for natural images, perhaps we can do something a little bit better. So for these natural images, unlike registered faces, um, the image's statistics are basically similar at different locations of the image. We could expect to see the same kinds of visual features show up anywhere. And so instead of having different features connected to each location, we're gonna share the parameters at each location. So instead of these you know, different feature detectors at different points of the image, what we're gonna have now is basically the same feature detector be replicated everywhere, okay? So this kind of shared local connectivity can actually be implemented very efficiently using a discrete convolution. So next, let's talk about what convolution is. So it's a specialized kind of linear operation, and what you can think about it like is basically a kind of weighted averaging in time or space. So from the image point of view, the weighted averaging is gonna be taking place in space. And in terms of the, the math that you see at the bottom, so what's happening here in the math, is that we're taking what's called a kernel. So the kernel is equivalent to the weights in a fully connected net, but it's smaller and it's shared everywhere. And we're gonna slide this kernel, also called a filter, sort of step by step all over the image. And we're gonna basically do a dot product between the elements of the kernel and the part of the image that's underneath it. Okay, so the, the result of the first uh, element of the output will be AW plus VX plus EY plus FZ, because basically the kernel is WXYZ, and underneath it is ABEF. So just a dot product between this guy and this guy. And then we're gonna shift this kernel over one element, and we're gonna do the dot product again. So it's gonna change ever so slightly, and we're just gonna keep shifting this and then we're gonna shift it down here and compute these elements. Okay, so that's you know, mathematically what's going on. Um, we're abusing terminology a little bit by calling this a convolution. It's actually something called a cross-correlation uh, because in convolution, if those of you have taken signal processing, it actually requires that we rotate the filter 180 degrees. Um, but typically in deep learning we don't do that because that can just sort of be absorbed in, in, into the learning. It's really not necessary, so there's no point doing sort of extra computation. Okay, so let's look at an animation. This is uh, an animation made by uh, Vincent Desmoulins and Francesco Vuzin, who uh, one was a student, one was a visitor at Mila. And we see here um, that basically unlike fully connected nets that we saw this morning, the units, they're not, the hidden units are not in a vector anymore, the hidden units are organized into this 2D topology. And we call this 2D topology a feature map. So each hidden unit, as you're seeing here, it only receives this 
input from a local region of the image. That's what we referred to before as its receptive field. So you see when you know, the filter's applied here and we're getting, we're getting the response for say this unit in the upper left corner, its receptive field is only this three by three top left uh, region of the image. Okay, it's not the whole image as we saw in the fully connected examples that we before, okay? So, you might have noticed that when we did that convolution originally, which this is just it being repeated over here, um, the size of the output feature map shrunk relative to the size of the image. We started with here a four by four uh, image, and the output is now two by two. Okay, so that's due to the border effects of the convolution operator. So it's actually common to apply padding to control the size of the output. Uh, so, for example, in the middle, we can pad this, like a certain amount, this is called half or same padding, and this will result in our input and our output being the same spatial dimensions. We can add more padding and actually make our output uh, larger than our input. And so in terms of what do we actually pad with? Well, usually uh, we just pad with zeros, it's simpler. Um, if we're concerned about uh, sort of spurious edges, uh, we can also use uh, just replicating the pixels at the, at the border of the image, or we can also reflect the image at its borders, and we call that symmetric padding. Okay, so that's convolution. Let's look at a real image and, and what we get from the convolution operator. So the output of doing this, this filtering or convolving with a kernel uh, is what I said before called a feature map. So you should really think of each feature, each pixel in the feature map as essentially uh, the the sort of like a detector. It's like a response map looking for a particular feature that's represented by that kernel. So here we've actually set the numbers or the parameters of this kernel by hand such, this such that this kernel represents an edge detector, okay? In this case, it's a horizontal uh, edge detector. But in the case of convolutional neural nets, these elements, the negative ones, zeros, and ones, aren't set by hand, they're actually learned parameters, okay? Analogous to the weights in the fully connected neural nets that we talked about this morning, okay? And those get updated via gradient descent, okay? So just note, Again, I'm just talking about, at this point, a single kernel, uh, an image, and a single feature map, but we're gonna quickly move on to multiple filters. In that case, I'll be talking about feature maps, okay? So, we've talked about, basically, like I said, involving a single filter or kernel with a single image that results in a single feature map output but of course, we want to learn more than a single feature. We don't want to just detect horizontal edges. We want to detect horizontal edges and vertical edges and diagonal edges and so forth. Um, so we want to learn multiple kernels. And so if we apply each one to multiple regions of the image, and with weight sharing here, assume we have maybe 100 filters or different types of features we want to detect in this image, uh, and we keep the same 200 by 200 image. We started with 4 million parameters before. Now, with the weight sharing and the local receptive fields, we're actually down to 10,000 parameters. Okay, so it's much more uh, manageable. Okay, so let's now just formally define the convolution layer. We've looked at the basic operations. Uh, a convolutional layer basically provides a mapping between input feature maps, we could also call these channels, and output feature maps. So at the first level, or layer of the network, these input feature maps would actually represent the data. So if it was a color image, these channels would represent red, green, and blue, perhaps, channels of the image. Uh, and then we have some arbitrary number of output feature maps. But further up in the network, these, would just, these guys would become these guys, and then we would have another layer of sort of arbitrary numbered uh, feature maps. And that's basically the number of feature maps is a hyperparameter set by the practitioner analogous to choosing the number of hidden units in a fully connected net. Okay, so associated with each input feature map, output feature map pair is a kernel. And so to compute this output feature map here, we're gonna convolve the kernel 
that's associated with each of these input feature maps with these images. So that's going to produce three response maps. And then we're going to sum them together. And that's going to give us this output feature map, just that one output feature map in dark green. OK, so this is what you're seeing is a sum over involving the kernel with uh, the input feature maps. OK? Um, we sum them. That will give us a response. Then we would go to the next output feature map. OK? And this output feature map would have three different kernels that are associated with these three input feature maps. We would apply those convolutions. We'd get three uh, spatially organized responses. And then we would sum them together element-wise. And that would give us the sort of pre-activation for this feature map. Uh, and then both of these output feature maps, just like the hidden units in a fully connected ne no, neural net, we apply an element-wise nonlinearity. These days, ReLU is the most popular one. OK, so that's what you're seeing here with G. This is a, an element-wise nonlinearity that's being applied to the output of a linear operation. So it's actually very, very much analogous to the fully connected nets we learned about this morning. You've got a linear operation uh, followed by an element-wise nonlinearity. Typically, we do include biases. Um, we just haven't shown them here to keep things a little bit simple. Uh, but typically, there is a bias associated with each output map, okay? not the individual units in the map. OK, so let's come up a bit from the weeds and do a quick recap. Uh, fully connected, sort of classical standard neural net uh, applied to images is going to scale quadratically with the size of the input. It's numbers of parameters. Remember, the sort of we started with these 2 billion parameters before. Uh, it doesn't leverage stationarity in the input. And so we can instead connect each hidden unit to just a small patch of the input and share the weights all across space. So it's called a convolutional layer because it's implemented efficiently by convolution. Okay, so a network with one or more convolution layers is called a convolutional network. OK, so up to now, we've discussed sort of one, oh, one second. Oh, maybe this, actually, I will take your question now, because we're, we're about to move on to the next sort of major component. Your question. So, uh, can you explain what exactly is stationarity? Oh, stationarity. OK, yeah, so stationarity uh, is talking about the statistics of the input image. And what I mean by this, you know, the stationarity of the statistics is that sort of the kinds of patterns that we might observe in the input don't depend on the location where we are at that input. So take the case of sort of natural images. We might see dogs and cats and balls and houses. Those typically could, uh, could occur anywhere in the image. So, that's, so basically what I mean is we don't want to have to learn like uh, a fur detector separately for the top right corner, the top left corner, the, the middle of the image, and everywhere else. We want to learn like one fur detector and be able to sort of apply it everywhere. Okay? So that's sort of when you do this weight sharing by replicating uh, these, these filters everywhere, that's kind of what you gain. You exploit this stationarity. Yes? Uh, you said convolution layer is a filter, right? So what exactly is it filtering? What is it filtering? Uh, so it's, uh, remember we talked about the units in the, the, sort of the individual units in a feature map of a convolutional net being some kind of detector. So it's basically filtering out the stuff that you don't care about. So say we have a fur detector. We're filtering everything else out and leaving a response to where there's fur somewhere in the image. Or a horizontal edge detector. Basically, we're having a response map for horizontal edges, but everything else where there is sort of no horizontal edges will be basically zero response. OK, so it's, it's, a, it's a filter for a very specific kind of feature, but what that feature actually is is going to actually be learned by gradient descent. So you know, we're training classifiers. It's actually going to learn what these, maybe it needs a horizontal edge detector, maybe it needs a fur detector, maybe it needs an eye detector, maybe it needs a nose, nose detector. It's going to learn those different types of detectors. Okay. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that uh, using convolutions on natural images makes sense because it has to appear everywhere. Yeah. Uh, 
Right, so like I was saying with the faces, faces are often registered. Um, and you raise an interesting example of medical imaging. I mean, there's been a lot of use of sort of generic style convolutional neural nets in medical imaging, and they seem, even though, you know, they don't have the same stationarity, they seem to work, right? But people also pr propose different architectural var variants for those domains as well. Uh, so I think both, both solutions are worth exploring, okay? And there's evidence of sort of generic methods and specialized methods doing well. Yes? Right, right, so yeah, so these, these nets can in, in a way be fooled into like finding a, a face or detecting a face when sort of the, say the eyes and nose would be like mixed up. Um, and they also sort of, depending on whether they're doing something like classification or semantic segmentation, they might use heavy pooling and sort of throw away a lot of spatial information that completely gets rid of any, any information about sort of the relative locations of the features. I will get to that a little bit uh, later on, about some, maybe some specialized architectures, okay? All right, so we've covered uh, a very important component, convolution, sort of the central component on a convolutional neural, neural net. Um, but CNN architectures often employ another stage called pooling. So in this case, assume that uh, the kernel at a particular layer in the network is an eye detector, but uh, we're just, detecting the presence of faces. We're not like localizing the faces, for example. All we care is whether there's, whether there's a face in the image. Okay, so in this case, we kind of want to make the detection ro robust to the exact location of the eye. We don't care exactly where the eye shows up in the image. Um, so we want the same response in the feature map if an eye is present at any particular location. So what we can do is we can pool in this case, for example, taking the, re the maximum response over the units in a particular local region of the feature map. Uh, and this allows us to gain robustness to the exact location of that feature, okay? So if the, sort of the eye detector fires at any of these regions, if we take the max, we'll get a detection, all right? So that gives us something called shift invariance, basically meaning if the eye shifts a little bit as long as it's not larger than this window, the uh, response will be the same uh, out of this pooled feature detector. So I mentioned max pooling, and this is by far and in, in, in large the most widely used recipe, but other types of pooling have been employed. Uh, so I'm, the, the notation here that I'm using is K is indexing the layer, and we're treating pooling as a separate layer, so we say sort of the unpooled feature map, K minus one, uh, indexed by M and N, so those are spatial indices. Um, and then there is the, and, and I is actually the, the channel here, uh, and then there's the output feature map, or the pooled feature map, element M, N spatially, and channel I. So what we do, is we take the maximum element in a local neighborhood around M and N here. Uh, and typically these, are, these, are ch these pooling neighborhoods are chosen to be very small, like two by two or three by three. This is just sort of, we do sort of gentle, gradual pooling and we don't very quickly dis destroy the spatial structure of the image uh, by doing pooling. Now, we can do other kinds of pooling, like for example, we can, sum and then take the size of the neighborhood, that gives us an at local average. Uh, we can do L2 pooling, very similar to averaging, and we can even pool not just over spatial neighborhoods, but we can, we can pool over the channels or the feature maps themselves as well. So here's a variant of L2 pooling that's actually pooling over features. You can see the index here is over the I's, which is, or, or sorry, over the J's, uh, which is um, the channel index. Okay, so different variants of pooling, but almost everywhere people are using pooling, they're using uh, max pooling. Even people have pr proposed some sort of learned or parameterized variants of pooling as well. Okay, so classical architectures that we're gonna review a little bit later on, like AlexNet, um, also GoogleNet, in addition to pooling, add another stage called local contrast normalization. 
And this means that for every unit in a feature map, we subtract the mean and we divide by the standard deviation in some local neighborhood around it. So it's kind of like pooling, but instead of sort of collapsing that region, you're actually doing some kind of normalization uh, based on the statistics of that region. And this can actually be implemented very efficiently by convolution as well. So this local contrast normalization, it gives us finer grain control over the dynamic range of each of the feature maps, and it can be performed even across features. So it can be, typically it's done spatially, but it can be done across features as well. And it can be applied everywhere from the input all the way to higher levels of the network. It improves the invariance properties of the feature uh, detectors, it improves optimization, and also increases sparsity of the feature maps. In recent years, it's been supplanted by something else you might have heard about called uh, batch normalization. And this is an important component in modern CNN architectures like ResNet. Any uh, type of um, very deep neural net typically is using uh, batch norm. And it, what batch normalization is, is essentially an, a, a method of adaptive reparameterization of the network. Um, the initial motivation when it was proposed was to kind of reduce the problem of coordinating updates across different uh, layers of the net because the different layers had all their own uh, different uh, statistics across batches. Um, so what they're doing in, in batch normalization, we'll see mathematically how it works in a second, but basically it normalizes the batch statistics at each layer of the network. So it's well known to lead to faster convergence and also reduced uh, sensitivity to hyperparameter choices. Okay, um, and the other thing I'll say is that the use of batch norm until very, very recently has been basically a necessary ingredient to train nets, say, over 16 layers uh, deep. Okay, so how does batch norm work? It's a little bit heavy on, on the math, uh, but the, the mathematics is, is, is each of the, these operations are relatively simple. So um, we're just using lin uh, linear indices here. Like this will be done in, in CNNs, but we're gonna index just each unit by some linear index alpha. So this is a particular unit uh, alpha. Um, so hidden unit alpha i means in example i unit alpha. We're gonna compute the mean of that unit over the batch, okay? So that will be mu, our mean. And then we're gonna compute the variance of that particular unit over the batch. So that's gonna be our sigma squared. And then we're gonna basically normalize these preactivations. So um, we're gonna subtract the mean, we're gonna divide by the variance. We add a small constant here, C, when we divide by the variance just to keep the, uh, from dividing by zero. And then the kind of key part of this is that we introduce these new parameters, gamma and beta, that are associated with those units. And those are learned, okay? So those are sort of learned rescaling. So this is a, a, a scaling and a shift parameter that get learned by uh, gradient descent. But everything else is just a defined operation, like a shift, the scale. Um, and so when we're computing the next layer's activation, we actually use the normalized preactivation passed through the nonlinearity uh, and then we, we run it through the weights and the biases as, as normal. Okay, so just to keep the math simpler, I've written everything as sort of fully connected net, but basically the analogous operation can be applied to convolutional neural nets, just operating on the unit level um, of those, those units inside the feature maps. Okay, so I wanna just uh, run through, like, this is a very tutorial style talk, but I will occasionally give highlights of sort of emerging research that I think is kind of cool. Uh, and there's a couple caveats about uh, batch norm. So one, uh, it's been generally viewed as kind of a free lunch. Makes training easier, reduces sensitivity, all these things are good. Um, but as noted earlier, experience has suggested that we can actually turn down other kinds of regularization when we're using it. So for example, L2 weight decay used to be very popular. People started using batch norm, they're not using L2 weight decay as much. Dropout also was more popular. The use of dropout has also waned uh, with batch norm. Um, 
So, of course, you can do this without reducing your test set accuracy, but we may also be concerned with robustness. And, and robustness is really our uh, network's response to uh, unintended or unseen inputs at deployment time. These might be out of distribution examples, they might be noisy examples, they might be examples that are designed by an attacker, so-called adversarial examples. Um, so my lab's results, uh, and if we have time I'll share a little bit with you, and those of other labs have shown that robustness can actually be less forgiving to discarding regularization, as has been done along with batch norm. Okay, so that's caveat one. Caveat two is a little bit more subtle. So batch norm, when it's doing this regularization, it's, or normalization, it's fixing the first and second moments of all the neurons equally at initialization time. And so it, it actually suppresses information that's contained in these moments that might be informative of class decisions in the case of classifiers. And so this effect gets further amplified when we start uh, stacking batch norm layers on top of each other. So let's look at a, um, an example uh, that, we, that we produced in a recent paper. Uh, so this is called the Adversarial Spheres uh, data set. It's a synthetic problem that consists of classifying between two concentric spheres. So you've got a, like a, a, a red class and a blue class. And you can run this data set in uh, arbitrary dimensions, but we're just looking at a 2D uh, example here. So um, every point is in 2D. And uh, as I said, the classes are represented by color, and we have too many batches. And let's assume that these too many batches of our examples, they're, they're solid and open, so the type of circle indicates the, the mini batch. Uh, and we're going to assume that they, in, they each contain an equal number of red class and blue class points. Okay, so if we look at the top row here, this is what the input looks like. You can see you know, the points in the two different classes and which mini batch they're assigned to. The statistics of the mini batches are very similar. Uh, we're assigning red and blue points equally to the batches. Um, but once we start stacking batch norm layers, we actually see that these sort of class relevant input distances get skewed. By layer 14, most of the structure, I should say that, sorry, the input is 2D, the future layers are not 2D but we're using P, uh, PCA to project down to two dimensions to visualize this. But you can see that basically by layer 14, the uh, relative distance are actually reflecting more the batch statistics as opposed to the original uh, class relevant distances in the input space. Um, but if you look at a network that doesn't use batch normalization, you actually see that those class relevant distances are preserved even after sort of 14 uh, layers of applying uh, nonlinearities. Okay, so essentially we have severe degradation of class relevant input distances, uh, and that's to some de degree concerning, as well as the destruction of the information by fixing the moments. So if we have time, I might come, a bit, come back a little bit later to say more about batch norm. Okay, so now that we've covered convolution, we've covered pooling, we've co covered uh, normalization of some sorts. We can put this together into the single stage of a convolutional neural net, okay? So in a single stage, we've got these three operations, which we talked about, convolution, which is linear, some kind of rectification, typically this is the ReLU nonlinearity, um, plus some normalization, either local contrast normalization or batch normalization, like I explained, and then some kind of pooling, typically. That's a classical, a uh, CNN stage. And then when we combine multiple stages, we actually start getting something that looks like a convolutional neural net. So you take this single stage, you replicate it, for example, and this time it's been replicated three times. And then in classical architectures, they typically have one or more fully connected layers like we learned about this morning at the end of the, the network towards the output. So uh, what would typically happen here is you've got feature maps that have a spatial topology, you would just vectorize them or collapse them to a single dimension and then connect that to a standard fully connected layer. Okay, question for you. Where are the majority of parameters in this neural network? In the convolutional stages or at the fully connected layer? In the fully connected part. Where does the most computation happen in this network? 
and the convolutional page. OK, so some of you guys have seen this before. OK, so that's, Im that's important. <laughs> OK, very good. Um, all right, so training comments. All the layers are differentiable, and that's good. Uh, so we can just use standard gradient descent methods. OK, so the standard procedure is for training a comnet, very similar to the feed forward nets. You have a mini batch of data. You do a forward prop. You do a backward prop to do your gradients. And then you do parameter updates by gradient descent. OK, so a couple questions in the front. No, I was doing it. I was doing batch norm to the pre activations. I say, say recti OK, this is just a plus rectification and normalization. But in, in the math, it was definitely happening to the pre activation. Thanks for making the distinction. Yes. Different architectures will use different orders. Um, I mean, one reason to do additional operations following pooling might be to reduce the computation in the net. Uh, but traditionally, it has been done this way. And that's just by, again, experimenters like you know trying different hyperparameters and some of them doing it more systematically than others. Uh, I think there's a question in the very back. Yeah. OK. OK, so I'm going to defer on that, because I, 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 if I have time later on, I will bring some of these results back to real images. We can't do visualizations like this, right? Because this is a toy example, and they're easy to visualize um, in low dimensional spaces. But I, I do have some results, uh, and I'll try to get to them. But we only have an hour and 50 minutes, so I don't know if I will. And I'm, I'm, I'm focusing more on the sort of the more basic stuff. Um, but I, I, and, and if I don't cover it, you can come talk to me after the, after the talk, OK? All right, I'm going to keep moving. Um, all right, so that's training. Test time, we just have to run forward propagation through the CNN. Okay, so the one interesting property of CNNs is that they can naturally process larger images uh, at little cost by just reusing computation. So it actually makes them a much more uh, effective method for larger images uh, than traditional methods that have used sliding windows. Okay, so, um, okay, little history lesson. I'd like to just take a moment to put comments in historical context. So they've actually been around in some shape or form since the 1980s. However, it's been only in the last few years that they've really started to accelerate uh, and achieve success on large scale vision tasks. Um, so the common wisdom up until 2012 is that we, would get, we were getting stuck in local minima, and that was a big problem. But now the thinking is that local minima really aren't the problem. There are plateaus. Uh, there are, of course, local minima, but the, the solutions, the, the results are all kind of similar. All right? So um, it just kind of takes a long time to break symmetry. And you'll hear further in the optimization uh, lecture um, some sort of more nuanced around this. The real challenges really at this point are not uh, optimization, especially when the data set is large and we use units that don't saturate very much, like ReLUs. Uh, and we use forms of normalization. Uh, the real technical challenges are generalization. Okay, so um, this is actually attracting a lot of renewed interest in the field, explaining the generalization capabilities of these really overparameterized systems. So, how many training examples are required to fit a billion parameters, or how many parameters and training examples are needed to model spaces that are a million input dimensions? So, really, scalability is uh, the real issue. And CNNs have seen this renewed success uh, because as, as time has gone by, we've gotten more data, we've gotten more compute power. And so you can see as we're pushing out data, pushing out compute in terms of floating, po floating point operations per second, this has allowed us to basically grow the capacity of these models um, as measured by their parameters. 
the introduction of general purpose GPU computing was a, a massive a boon to the CNN field. It completely changed the, the field. Uh, we started using it at U of T when I was a grad student about 2008. We were like coding CUDA kernels by ourselves, like the software infrastructures weren't there. It was a real challenge, but we saw the promise of it. And now, like, it's, CUDA just baked in to the back end of PyTorch and TensorFlow. Uh, and so there's really no reason uh, beyond maybe cost not to use uh, s GPUs when you're, when you're dealing with uh, CNNs. Okay, but it's basically enabled cheap kind of personal supercomputers, highly optimized for the kinds of computations performed uh, by these deep learning systems. Okay, so, the, so the, the summary of this story is that until 2012, uh, CNNs in, were in some ways kind of premature. We didn't really have enough data, we didn't have enough flops to train them, uh, and they would overfit and be kind of slow to train and the community kind of saw this as getting stuck in local minima, but that was kind of a red herring. So we continue to scale uh, compute power and data. Uh, this will continue to allow us to grow capacity, but we need methods that scale. So the next thing that we're gonna go into now are some methods that have really actually scaled up uh, CNNs beyond the very classic ones I showed you earlier. Yes? Both, everything, yeah. So I think of the total dimensionality of the, the input when I say that. So it's a good question. I think it's sort of the input as a tensor. Some one dimension of that is gonna be, or two dimensions is gonna be sort of spatial dimensions. You're gonna have sort of a batch dimensions. You're gonna have channel dimensions. So when I think of sort of the input dimensionality, I think about all of those dimensions. And all of those things can scale up. And even when we move to video, we'll introduce a time dimension, and that will also become part of the issue associated with scalability as well, okay? All right, so now let's move on to the sort of these, these architectures that scaled up. I'm gonna move sort of chronologically. Uh, AlexNet, it's now famous for its astonishing performance in 2012 on this ILS uh, VRC, uh, and it, it beat the next runner up by 10%. So this is a big deal, particularly opened the eyes of a lot of computer vision researchers, and uh, it was similar in its style to the early Lynette style architectures that we saw earlier today. Um, but it was deeper, it was bigger, it used stacked convolutional layers that weren't interspersed with pooling. So it did a few things architecturally that were kind of different. And Alex Krzyzewski, who was a grad student at the same time as me in Toronto, he, he was a GPU wizard. Like he's a really early adopter. He's probably the best sort of uh, technical person in the lab at the time. Uh, he had two GPUs in his workstation where most of us had one GPU and he actually took advantage of that. And so he designed the architecture to be sort of optimized for his two GPU system. So you can actually see in the architecture here, uh, some of you might know this, some of you might not, you can see these splits. And these splits would happen when sort of he would put uh, some feature maps onto one GPU, do some computation in parallel, put this onto another GPU, do some computation, and then he would bring them back together. So it was actually, it was, kind of interesting anecdote. It was an architecture kind of uh, designed for what he had available to him. Uh, AlexNet also took advantage of the recently developed dropout regularizer. That was like new news at the time, uh, but it used it quite judiciously. And it was just a really successful architecture. It's still a benchmark for a lot of people's experiments. Now, network and network, it was, was not a competition winning architecture, but it proposed a number of interesting architectural elements in 2013 that were later used by many state-of-the-art architectures. So in particular, it replaced linear convolution as we described earlier with a kind of micro network structure. So you can imagine instead of doing like sliding this linear kernel over the image, you're sliding like a mini NL MLP or feed forward net over the image. Um, and it was basically sort of general nonlinear function operator, sort of embedded in the convolution. And then also recognizing that, uh, sort of vectorizing the highest level feature maps, reducing them to a vector, and then applying fully connected layers was really expensive, and particularly in terms of the number of parameters, it did away with that, and, and used something called global average pooling. Um, so the traditional way to do global average pooling 
is via one-by-one -one convolutions. And this might seem totally crazy to you, like convolving with a one-by-one -one kernel, what does, what does that mean? Um, but what it is is basically like a collection of dot products that are happening all over the image. So you see here, imagine you have, um, I shouldn't even say image, this, this usually happens at the end of a network, um, but it can also happen during the network as well. So say you have a collection of uh, feature maps at a particular layer, the spatial dimensions are 56 by 56, and there's D of them. D could be like 128, for example. And you want to reduce the dimensionality to C dimensions, C channels, C or C feature maps, while retaining the same uh, spatial dimensions. Okay, so what you can do is you can convolve with like C filters that are this size, one by one by D. And so that amounts to doing basically this dot product in the D dimension all over this image. It doesn't change its spatial dimensions, but for each of these C guys, when we do the dot product, we sum over the dimension D. So if we do this C times, we actually get C slices. Okay, so it's basically a linear dimensionality reduction. You can also kind of think about it as like a, a sort of a PCA, learned PCA happening in, in the net. Um, but once you've done this, you can basically take the number of channels and reduce them to any, kind of any number of channels you want. And so when you do this for global average pooling, what you typically do is you make C the number of classes in your classifier. So this would be your last set of feature maps. You would make this, say, how you're using CIFAR 10, you had 10 classes, you'd make this 10, and so you'd reduce your feature maps is something that's 10 by 56 by 56, and then you would just average pool across the spatial dimensions, so you're left with something that's one uh, by 10, and then you apply a softmax to that. So this is an alternative to having vectorizing and fully connected layers. It's really parameter efficient, um, even though it seems on the outset kind of a crazy thing to do one by one convolutions. So, uh, as I said, the network and network kind of proposed this idea, but this was picked up by other popular architectures like Inception, uh, the, or also known as GoogleNet, um, which introduced the module. The, really, the, the module that they introduced was called Inception. The whole architecture uh, is, is really called GoogleNet. People sometimes call the whole architecture Inception, but it was the winner of ILS VRC 2014. Okay, so it posed the following sort of statement. You know, at each layer of the ConvNet, you could have five by five convolutions, or you could have three by three convolutions, or you could have one by one convolution, or you could have max pooling. Why make the choice? Why not just do everything, okay? So um, they had this, like I said, inception module that basically did everything. Uh, and it, it, when it did max pooling, like it would use special padding such that everything was the same size and then it would just sort of concatenate everything together. Uh, and it made judicious use of this one by one convolution to reduce the dimensionality so things kind of didn't, didn't get blown out of control in terms of parameters. So, um, you know, one thing to point out, compared to 60 million parameters in AlexNet before it, it only had four million uh, parameters. And uh, we can see here the connection to network and network, uh, not just the one by one convolutions, but also this idea, this sort of mini-module uh, that network, by network and network had introduced, okay? The other thing I'll point out about Inception that was kind of interesting is that they introduced this, I don't know if they were first to introduce it, but they, they used this idea of auxiliary classifiers, which you can see in these yellow blocks here. So it's the idea of putting a softmax output at intermediate layers of the net and basically you could compute an error from doing a prediction at different points in the network and then have gradient flow into sort of intermediate parts of the net. And that helped with uh, the problem of vanishing gradients. Okay, so VGGNet was a runner up of the same competition and it actually serves, it still serves as a fairly strong baseline because it's very homogeneous. It really only performs three by three convolutions and two by two max pooling and that's it. It just keeps repeating that kind of module, uh, beginning to end. But despite its conceptual simplicity, it's actually pretty expensive to evaluate. It uses a lot of memory. 
and has a lot of parameters. Okay, so it's kind of a clunky architecture. However, though the original proposal included fully connected layers, it was later revised because they found that the fully connected layers could be replaced with global average pooling, like I told you about before, uh, and massively reduce the number of parameters in the net. So there's like more efficient versions of VGG. Um, okay, now on to ResNet. So ResNet comes along, wins the 2015 ILS VRC competition, and is still the backbone of most modern CNN type systems. Uh, it's similar to a more complex and concurrently proposed architecture called highway networks. And it took a massive leap forward in terms of trainable depth. So they were able to, uh, in, their, in their winning entry to ILS VRC, they had a 152 layer network, like compared to something like VGG 16 layer at the time. So that was a massive lump leap forward. And they even showed in the paper that you could train networks of 1,000 layers of, of depth. And this is because they featured a special type of skip connection, meaning you skipped over uh, layers of the network as opposed to having only layers proceed sequentially, layer to layer. Um, they also used heavy use of batch normalization. So the key kind of architectural insight here is this thing called a residual module. And this residual module or residual block, it provides the input directly to later layers. So instead of you know, transforming X, passing that to the next layer, it actually passes X up to uh, sort of to the future. And the subnetwork here is tasked not by sort of having to remodel X, it actually models the residual. And the network can effectively determine its own depth because it can choose to just learn an identity and pass X forward and sort of short circuit parts of the network. So it's kind of like a dynamically adjusting depth. Um, and the other sort of intuition is that basically it's, it's kind of forced, it forces the internals of the net to learn something different than what's already been modeled because it's, 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 always, it's already getting X. It doesn't have to be forced to uh, relearn it. Okay. Two more architectures to cover. I think that are ones that are particularly interesting. So ResNet, and highway networks, and stochastic uh, depth nets, uh, fractal nets, all these sorts of architectures that were coming out at the time. They have different network typologies and different training procedures, but they all have this similar, uh, similar characteristic. They create these sort of shortcut paths uh, from early layers to later layers. And so dense net takes this to the extreme. It connects each layer to every other layer in a freed forward fashion. And in this, within this module, it calls a dense block. So you can see this layer, the first layer here, it actually has connections directly to every other layer. This layer has connections to all the layers in front of it. Um, and so this is interesting for a few reasons. So because they don't use any pooling in here, and they use uh, convolutions that preserve the spatial dimensions, you basically don't have uh, summation like you do in ResNets, you get concatenation. And uh, dense net's really able to avoid vanishing gradients because each layer has direct access to the gradients from the loss function, okay? So you can see that there's gradient flow to this red guy, it doesn't have to come all the way through the net, it can come directly to it. And this is true for all of the layers. It gets basically direct gradient flow. Um, so this kind of leads to an implicit deep supervision and, and similar to the style or the spirit of the auxiliary classifiers that we talked about before. Um, and these dense net layers are very narrow. Like for example, 12 feature maps or 12 channels. Um, because it only has to add like a, a certain amount of channels at each stage to sort of preserve or add to this co collective knowledge that's being uh, kept by the network. So it's able to really heavily reduce number of parameters. Question? Does the gradient flow rotate from the highway and the Yes, so it, it, it goes, yeah, forward and backwards. That's right. So anyways, this is sort of the dense block and then that will be sort of it will be repeated at various parts of the net, and then they'll still have essentially convolution and pooling sort of between these uh, dense blocks. 
Now, the last architecture that I'm going to profile is something called squeeze and excitation networks. Um, it was the winner of ILS VLRC 2017. I think that was the last year the competition was held. And it proposed what's called a squeeze and excitation block. And this performs adaptive recalibration of the feature maps. And so what this means is that following the convolution, okay, so we have sort of a standard convolution here to get the feature maps. We're going to apply this oper operation that aggregates uh, the feature maps across the spatial dimension. So it's effectively a one by one convolution followed by uh, pooling across the spatial dimensions. Very, like, it's basically the same as global average pooling that we saw before. So we get this kind of one by one by C uh, vector. Then we apply, so we call that first step the squeeze. So this kind of, this is like a, a global embedding of the information contained in this feature map. Uh, and then we apply a small MLP to it, maintaining the C dimension. And so this is, we call this the excitation. And this produces a set of C modulation weights. And then we basically scale the original feature maps by these modulation weights. Uh, there's learned parameters in here. Uh, and so that's why we call it kind of an adaptive recalibration. Yes? It's similar in spirit, right, in that you have this kind of gating mechanism. But it's also similar to a lot of other things. Like, for example, people are using uh, these uh, things called film for multimodal learning, where you have sort of like a, a text network that's gating an image network. Um, but you also have sort of gating operations in LSTMs and so forth. So you, you do see this kind of modulation showing up in many different places. Yeah. OK. So just to give a quick summary of these modern architectures, there's a wide variety of them freely available. Uh, and what this nice picture from Eugenio Curlicerlio's blog shows is that you can have this trade-off between kind of complexity in terms of operations. So this is the giga operations required on the x-axis to propagate an image net image through the network. And on the left is the top one accuracy reached on the image net benchmark. So the one trend to see in this is that you know, despite a fairly rapid increase in top one accuracy by pushing out in giga operations, um, we're perhaps reaching an inflection point. Okay? It's not just a matter of, sort of continuing to scale up. I should also say that the size of each of these circles is reflective of the parameters of those nets. So remember, we talked about VGG and those being really heavily parameterized. That's why you see VGG with pretty massive circles here. The other thing I'll point out is that people have started to work on specialized architectures designed for low memory, uh, low power devices. You see things like squeeze net, uh, mobile net, and so forth, where you, you know, reduce the parameters but maybe sacrifice some top top one accuracy. OK. So we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm going to have to be a bit creative about what I decide to cover. Um, I had a little bit like more researchy stuff. I'll probably cut some of that out. Uh, I think what I'll do is uh, cover sort of the, some different types of convolution that are important in sort of modern architectures. So uh, we covered basic. Uh, convolution where we assume that we were sliding the kernel one by one element at a time. Uh, and there's something called stride that really describes the amount of shift that you move this kernel. So the, the default is stride one, but you can certainly have stride greater than one. And what you're seeing uh, in this little movie here is a stride two. You see how it's actually, when we apply the kernel, we're actually skipping two elements uh, and instead of one. And so the effect here is that we're actually reducing the dimension of the output when we do that. Okay? So um, strides can therefore uh, represent a kind of subsampling operation. You can actually see it quite implicitly. Another, so one view of st strides is exactly what we're seeing over here. You kind of shift by, a, uh, by more than one element. But another view of it is just applying a straightforward convolution with a stride one. Uh, taking the output of that and then discarding some of the elements. Okay, it's equivalent. Now, what's the more efficient uh, operation, view one or view two? Uh, 
one. Like you, you wouldn't want to do view two because you do extra work, right? Like you're computing things and then you're throwing them away. So you wouldn't want to do it that way. But they are basically equivalent, two different views of the, of the same thing. So an example of the use of strides uh, greater than one is in something called the all convolutional net. And this is a popular architecture that exploits striding. So what it shows is that you can actually do away completely with max pooling layers just by using strides greater than uh, one without any loss in accuracy as well. And they also have this other contribution where um, they simplify one of the early techniques for visualizing CNNs. This is the deconvolution method of uh, Matt Zeiler and Rob Fergus. And they even propose a visualization technique of their end. Okay, but the main point here is that it's a, a convolutional architecture that's entirely composed of convolutional layers. That's it. Okay, um, it, and at the end it uses one by one convolutions and global average pooling. All right, the other convolution I want to talk about that gets used a fair bit is something called dilated convolution, also known as a true uh, convolution. So this inflates the convolution kernel by putting little spaces in between its elements. And the effect of this is that it's able to increase the size of the receptive field for any unit without actually having to increase the size of the kernel. So you can keep the number of parameters the same, but widen receptive fields. So this is important if you want layers sort of high up in your network to see a larger portion of the input, maybe capture more global information. So you can see here by striding, we've actually uh, increased uh, the receptive field for any of these units. It's actually looking at basically a, a, five, a five by five window for each uh, element in the output. Okay, so most famously, this was actually exploited in a network that did convolution on audio signals, something called WaveNet. They made heavy use of this dilated convolution. Okay, and, and I should say, when you're doing 1D CNNs for time series, dilated convolution can be very uh, convenient to increase the receptive field over time such that you're able to model longer term temporal dependencies. Okay, so the last kind of convolution that I'm gonna cover is something called a transpose convolution. Uh, so this achieves a transformation that's kind of opposite in direction to the normal convolution. So we can start this classic example of a four by four input and a two by two output. A uh, transpose of this would go from something that's two by two to four by four. Okay, so we can see below the transpose convolution being implemented by a direct convolution with padding. So this is sort of the easiest way to visualize it, but that's kind of an, uh, an inefficient way of implementing it because you're sort of having to add these rows and columns. In modern libraries, they just implement these transpose convolutions directly, and you don't have to really worry about doing this. I remember you know, when I was a postdoc in 2009, 2010, implementing transpose convolutions kind of in this inefficient mechanism. Uh, but at that time, we didn't really have uh, good libraries uh, for, for doing transpose convolutions. Okay, so it's been used all over the place. Uh, it's used as the decoder, in convolutional autoencoders like VAEs, uh, GANs, uh, CNNs for semantic segmentation like fully connected nets, UNets often used in medical imaging, uh, and also in visualization schemes where we used to call it deconvolution, but that was kind of a bad name for it. Uh, okay, so the, I think the last thing I'm gonna say is that training and deploying deep learning, it's traditionally been done on GPU uh, enabled servers, but it's starting to move to devices like phones, dedicated hardware, and so forth. So it really motivates the need for resource constrained models. And there's many ways of doing this. I'm not gonna get into any details about it, but I wanna make you aware, you, know, you can do things like network compression. So for example, predicting the parameter, predicting some parameters from other parameters. Or you can do network pruning, where you figure out which parameters in your network are not really important, and the, the definition of important is gonna change with the different methods, and eliminating them. Or you can also have sort of structured ways of factoring your weights. And all of these can reduce the computation, the memory requirements of these nets. Uh, low precision learning 
is another way that's been particularly effective. Uh, we've done some work in this in my lab as well. We often take sort of 32-bit floating point for granted when we're using TensorFlow and PyTorch, but you can actually implement weights and activations and gradients uh, as low-precision data types. And actually, some of the new GPU hardware actually has uh, efficient implementations for low-precision floating points like FP8, uh, which is very fast on the new cards, and a lot of people don't often take advantage of it. Okay, so um, I want to save a, a, a little bit time for ad additional questions, so I think what I'm going to do is skip a little bit of the, the researchy optional stuff I had uh, and, and, and basically conclude. So where CNNs are applicable, um, we've talked about 2D CNNs today, mainly for images, but they're more widely applicable to signal data. So for example, they've been applied to audio, They've been applied to text, which has been converted into uh, continuous features. Uh, video, you'll hear about more of that from Greg Morey later in the school. Um, and so this kind of data, where CNNs really work well, shares several properties. Okay, so the first property is that it's stored as multi-dimensional arrays or, or tensors, okay? They also feature one or more axes that has this kind of ordering to it. So for images, there's a height and a width, okay, and the order is important. Or in time series, there's a time dimension, and the order is important. Um, and then there's also another axis, typically, which is the channels. And that is used to sort of access different views of the data. So in images, we've got a red and a green and a blue color channel. Uh, maybe in audio, we have a sort of a left and a right uh, view of that uh, audio signal, okay? I want to point out, though, that a very hot topic of research is developing certain forms of CNNs that are appropriate for non-Euclidean data, like graphs. Okay, so in summary, uh, it's kind of a fire hose of information. Uh, thank you for your, your questions so far. Um, CNNs are really this interesting architecture that's been around for a long time, but really come into its own only really since 2012. And it's really the quintessential architecture for deep learning and computer vision. But as we said, it's been successfully applied to NLP and speech and other areas, as will be covered in later parts of the school. So GPUs have really fueled their advance, but I also mentioned that we're seeing it in embedded hardware like phones. We're seeing dedicated uh, ASICs like Google's TPU uh, for doing tensor-based operations. And I think that reaching the same heights with non-vectorial data that we have done for sort of vectorial or Euclidean data uh, really is the next frontier. So with that, I will thank you very much and I'll take some questions. In the front. Yes. Um, for example, let's say we're on 52, we realize that the common layer uh, identity map instead of even the, uh, the weights. Uh, would it be ethical to moving those weights to sort of an identity map for that example? Yes, so it's typically, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Network pruning is typically done at the level of the parameters or at the level of the units. And there's various methods for doing this. Um, I am unaware of a method that takes like entire blocks and plumes them away, but I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if something exists. But you, you may need to ac account for those operations that you're doing. There's usually some sort of like retraining stage that, that happens when you do that. Uh, okay, yes. Um, regarding your adversarial game, were those two in Yes. Okay, so I, I think I get the gist of your question. So you're asking about the sort of the finding around uh, vulnerability to adversarial attacks and the relationship to batch norm. Um, and you're asking sort of, are there regularizers that can as assist with, with, with that? So um, 
I didn't really get into the details of that, but I'm quite excited about this line of work. The punchline is that batch norm typically gives you a modest increase of accuracy, but it drops your model's robustness to noise and to certain, actually many types of adversarial attacks. Um, and so what we found is uh, we haven't tr tried like a slew of different regularizers. We found even like things, simple things like L2 weight decay can be quite effective. Uh, I don't know if Angus, the student that's been working on it, has, has been investigating. I, I know he's aware of sort of the Lipschitz style regularizers, um, but I don't know if he's actually conducted a set of experience, experiments to sort of look at that particular form of regularization and its relationship to batch norm yet. Uh, one thing I would say that we, we found in terms so of an alternative to batch norm that works very well for deep nets is something called Fix Up, a paper at um, iClear this year, which is an alternative initialization. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, gray shirt. It includes manifolds, yeah, so non-Euclidean, just basically, you're not re representing your data by points in some Cartesian space. So it could be graphs, could be manifolds, uh, could be many, many different types of data. Uh, you know, we're just used to, with neural nets, representing everything with vectors, like just a collection of, of points, right? Uh, so it's kind of the idea of getting away from that. Of course, there's other kinds of structured data that's out there. Uh, that can be, you know, as, as essentially re represented by different data structures that are not tensors, right? Uh, and, and I think that's why I say, so the next frontier, it sort of opens the world of deep learning to all these different types of data structures and, and, and data sets. There's a great review paper on sort of non-Euclidean uh, deep learning. Janneke is an author, uh, one of the Bronsteins, I think Michael Bronstein is one of the authors on that paper too. There's a, there's a few sort of overview, overviews on that. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yeah, in the back. I didn't quite catch the, your, your whole question. Specialized architectures for... Are there special architectures for spherical uh, data? Um, so... Uh, like, are you you're, are you talking about sort of like circulant type type data, or like, can you give me an example of a? I see. So, like, it'd be circular. So, it could be, um, yeah, like an atmosphere or even a manifold that sort of wrapped around on itself. Uh, yes, I haven't worked with them myself, but they're uh, actually in this sort of same community they were mentioning before. They have worked on uh, variants of convolutional networks for that kind of uh, manifold or spherical type data, but I'm not an expert in that in that area. Uh, yeah. Oh, a, an intuition or basic explanation for why skip connections are, are helpful? Yeah, so the most basic reason for them being helpful is that they allow gradient flow to propagate very easily back to earlier layers of the network. So one of the key concerns with training networks via gradient descent, which employs the back propagation algorithm, is that you've got to go back layer by layer. And you're basically multiplying sort of small numbers with other small numbers, and, and things sort of shrink. But when you have these short circuit or skip connections, you can take this gradient information and shoot it back to earlier layers of the network. Uh, so it gets signal, and, and, and you can update parameters from that. So that's, that's the main advantage, is the avoiding vanishing gradients. Yeah, it's still popular to use ReLUs. So ReLUs is, is another way of sort of allowing for gradient flow because you don't have these saturated regions where, where, where gradients die out. So you had mentioned that you intend to use something like dynamic uh, selection of number of layers by like, uh, but then you still have the ReLU, so there's still nonlinearity. Oh, absolutely, there's still nonlinearity. Yeah, so, um, 
let's just say sort of approximate uh, sort of identities. But yeah, there's there's obviously the, the nonlinearity that's imposed by the ReLU in the in the network. Right. Good point. Yes. Right, it's, it, you don't often use it for fully connected layers, that's right. However, it's just, like it's lacking for some uh, information that it hasn't completed. So is there some how that you, you can see uh, use that, like why it can't be specific to connected layers, however, it's uh, very useful for the same concept? Well, I know an observed effect has been that it actually limits uh, the depth of fully connected nets. Um, so this is explored by a uh, paper by Greg Yang and colleagues in, in 2019 that has some interesting experiments on that. Um, I don't know if I can give you sort of a, an intuitive explanation for sort of why it doesn't work as well. Um, I guess I would point you to that. It's like Greg Yang's work from 2019, but looking at sort of the limits of allowable depth uh, as a relationship of sort of batch size uh, and whether batch norm is employed or, or, or not. Yeah. Just your last question there. Greg. Last question? Okay, last question. Okay, so I think your question is sort of batch, batch norm adds a kind of noise to, so, wh wh so why are you saying it adds a noise to the, the network? Because you are looking at the mini batches during those two periods and how they are exposed to optimization rather than a full stream data set. Right. But that's not a, I, I, of course, you, so you have this sort of stochastic effect that you're working with mini batches. Um, but even if you didn't use net norm, you would still be using mini batches and having sort of a, a stochastic approximation to, to true gradient descent. Um, I'm not sure if that effect is amplified by, by using batch norm. Um, I guess you're rescaling by batch statistics, so there could be sort of like a sort of ampli amplification of um, the this, this stochastic induced by mini batches. Um, I think your question is like, you know, you, maybe this additional stochasticity you have induced by the batch norm could be um, a regularizer such that it would make your model more robust than noise, and it seems to be counterintuitive with, with, with the, what the finding is. Um, I would have to think a little bit harder about, uh, about that. I, I don't know if batch norm is actually adding a lot of noise to the model. Again, I'd have to sort of sit down. Um, it, 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 you can look at, so the, the paper is called a Batch Norm is the Cause of Adversarial Vulnerability, and we have it on archive. So you can look at the experiments. Um, I mean, I, we've conducted it across a, a various, like a wide array of architectures, um, and also a number of different data sets, like standard benchmarks, but even like common corruptions data set that looks at like 25 different noise types. Uh, and, and, and do you find the, this relationship sort of between decreased robustness and batch norm seems to exist in, in, in a lot of these settings. Okay. Uh, so thanks again, Graham.